Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we have Cody Drummond, founder of Peacekeeper, a revolutionary app that's in direct competition with the inefficiencies of 911 and the monopoly on violence known as the police. <laughs> so, Cody, tell us a little bit about your app. Yeah, so the Peacekeeper app uh, is a decentralized network of emergency responders. Uh, it allows you to uh, establish emergency response networks with your friends, family, and neighbors uh, for the purpose of immediate emergency response. It's made for your household. So anytime uh, a medical fire intruder or abduction uh, emergency goes down, you can hit one of those buttons on the main screen of the app, and uh, it'll immediately send that out to all your neighbors and uh, prompt them to respond quickly. Cool. So so it's, uh, so, so what kind of message do they, do they get on their phone? What, what pops up? So the messaging is done through the app and push notifications. Uh, what you will see when you get an alert is you will see a screen, and uh, you can see more at peacekeeper.org. But uh, the screen you'll see uh, has the uh, symbol of the fire emergency. Let's say it's a fire. It's going to show you the flames and stuff, uh, the visuals. It'll show the picture of the person sending out the alert. It'll show their address. Um, it'll show anyone else who's responding to the alert. Mm -hmm. wow. And it'll give you an option to chat back and forward and uh, send further details like, hey, I'm trapped upstairs, mm -hmm. or uh, hey, everyone's out of the house and everyone's safe. Yeah. Wow. So, so when did you um, when did you start with this this app? When, when did it come about? You know, I started working on the project uh, about three years ago, um, and uh, the app is just kind of hitting the market and coming to fruition here. Um, we just uh, released it for sale about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, now that we're pretty confident in the stability of the system, uh, it's ninety nine cents now on the Google Play and Apple Store. And I also heard that uh, it's popular internationally, right? Right. You know, during the testing phases when everything wasn't so stable, we managed to get users in all 50 states and about 20 countries. Um, wow, 20 countries. The network's nice. not nearly as big as we'd like it to be. Uh, we want to grow it much, much bigger, and we think we're going to. Um, but uh, we got to put a little more time into it to make that happen. So do you have uh, like a, a Facebook group for people who have questions or anything like that? Or Absolutely. And the best way to find a Facebook group is to just go to peacekeeper.org. Uh -huh. That's our main website. And uh, there's a Facebook link you can click there on the home page. And uh, that'll take you right to our Facebook page. Nice. So, so you, get, you have yet to translate it, right, to, to various languages? <laughs> yes. But, you know, we've had multiple people offer to help with translations. Um, and that will be coming, you know, probably uh, Japanese and uh, Spanish will uh, definitely be a future option and more. So, so explain to me how, how this is superior to 911, conventional 911 and emergency response. Well, um, the goal of Peacekeeper is to be superior to public response systems, and I don't think it's very difficult to accomplish that goal. Um, right now, I will say that in some situations, it can be superior because I, in most, most of the time when a person calls 911, uh, the police don't show up till about 10 minutes. Sometimes it's a lot longer than that. Wow. Now, if this is uh, someone that's attacking you in your home or a threat to you, uh, that's too long. They're not going to show up in time. Oh, yeah. Uh, whether the police are uh, nice people or not or want to help or not is irrelevant. They don't have the manpower and capability to help people in, these, in most of these emergencies. They show up after the crimes happen. Your neighbors are right next door, and they know you. They know your face. They, a lot of times they know the layout of your home. They know your children. They know your dog. So your neighbors can respond immediately with the right incentives and the right perspective. Now, we do encourage people to get training uh, when they get on these networks, especially if they plan on uh, going into someone's home with a weapon eventually. Um, training is very important. Um, when you say training, what, what do you mean exactly? 
Well, depending on what you're doing, you know, if you think that you're going to be responding to a medical emergency, uh, it makes sense to get some, maybe some CPR training and some basic medical training on how to uh, assess a person and uh, how to help a person out in, in a variety of different emergencies. If you think that you're going to be um, going into someone's home when an intruder breaks in, uh, you better get trained in self-defense yeah. and how to handle that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, like I, uh, I took a few years of karate when I was young. I don't know if that applies. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You know, the idea with pe- peacekeepers looking to partner with, with trainers that are really going to be able to uh, uh, put the people in, in the right mindset and, and train them in the situations that they will actually encounter. Mm-hmm. You know, so our hope is to have uh, have a, a scenario where people can be trained on how to defend your home with a firearm or how to go into a neighbor's home with a firearm without shooting your neighbor and without shooting your neighbor's dog. <laughs> yeah. Because exactly. uh, the public emergency responders seem to have a problem doing that. And a lot of that is because they don't know you. You know, they don't know what you look like. They don't know your face. They're strangers. Exactly. I mean, they'll show, their, show up in time to so you can fill out paperwork, right? <laughs> They're good for that. <laughs> That's why a lot of a lot of I hear a lot of people say that uh, we already live in a state of anarchy because police always show up after the fact, <laughs> <You know>? right? <laughs> right? Like, what good is it? How you know? What good is it if they're like you know such a delay or lag between the time you call and the time they get there, right? It's very very rare that a police officer will show up to stop. Uh, stop a bodily threat to you or stop someone intruding into your home. Mm -hmm. That's just extremely rare. (laughs) And police will admit that, you know, it just doesn't happen. I guess that would be just another, uh, you know, nail in the coffin for the, uh, for the, um, you know, the necessity of the state in that, you know, some people say, well, we need the police to protect us from bad people, but, but they're never there. So, (laughs) <laughs> How are they? Right. To me, to me, a greater incentive is having having everyone be a protector from bad people. Because you know, if you have a system that works, less people are going to think about harming you or committing a crime. When you have a system that doesn't work and doesn't catch the criminals and doesn't show up in time, yeah, that incentivizes crime. Yeah, like it. Um, I remember um, Larkin Rose often says, you know, when when people ask him. Um, you know, in a stateless society, you know, who would protect the people, you know, against murderers and rapists and thieves, you know, he's like, well, what about you? Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you protect your neighbor? Would you be willing to intervene if you saw somebody, you know, being assaulted or, or something, you know, um, right. or would you just stand by and watch it? <laughs> right? Right. And, and the problem is, you know, the problem is that the people have been so domesticated, um, that they they don't practice these things, they don't train these things, they don't take on these responsibilities. You know, the truth is that there's no difference between a uh, police officer and anyone else. There's, there's a reason why police officers, when, when something's happening, they respond and they, they address it. Even off-duty police, if they see a confrontation get involved, it's because, uh, one, they've decided that it's their job, and two, they've got training for it and got used to doing it. So we're encouraging peacekeepers to do the same thing. Take on some responsibility and get some training. And once you're prepared, you'll be confident to do these things. Right now, people have a lot of fear because they've never done it. People fear the unknown. Yeah. Um, all it takes is a little training and a little bit of community building, and uh, we can do it better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was just watching this, uh, this comedian. I don't know if you heard of Michael Connell. He's an Australian comedian. And he, no. he, I saw this video recently. He talked about the bystander effect, which is like when, when let's say, somebody's having a heart attack or, I don't know, I guess, um, let's say even somebody's getting assaulted by police, let's say, right, in public, and you have so many people on the outside just watching, doing nothing. Right. <laughs> like some, somebody's having a heart attack. It's like everybody's just watching. Nobody's doing anything. So the bystander effect is, you know, like... Um, nobody's doing anything, so I'm, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> so everybody's <Right>. thinking that. <laughs> the bystander effect is a real uh, scientific effect. It, it's real. It's there, which is why when we built Peacekeeper, when we built the feature in for the emergency response group, we capped it at 12 members. Uh, because the idea was that the smaller, the more tight-knit your group is, the more you actually respond when an emergency does happen. Yeah. And they're less likely to 
and pass the buck off to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And the more likely they're going to be to train together and to have these meetings together and get to know each other. Yeah. Yeah, like, um, you know, let's say, for example, this, this Ebola thing recently, like, um, you know, people are you know, saying it's a crisis over there all the way in, you know, in, in this African country, you know, we should send aid, we should send money. And then I'm like, well, what about, why don't you just help your neighbor? I think your neighbor, you know, like, <laughs> if your neighbor is sick, why don't you just help your neighbor, send money to your neighbor? Why are you going to send money overseas, you know, where you don't know where it's going, you don't know the people there? You know, people have, like, I guess, an aversion to helping those in their immediate vicinity. <laughs> right. I mean, I feel like it's because it's not really their decision anyways. So they find a way to justify it. You know, people don't want to recognize the fact that their money is being taken from them. You know, if the money wasn't taken, maybe people would have uh, have that mindset. I don't know. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't know. We, we don't give anything to anybody. The money's taken from us and given to someone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no, no. No, I'm talking about like, um, like, you know, some people who actually want to, you know, send money to, let's say, you know, uh, oh, right. Liberia. Oh, whatever. okay, to like, yeah. right, right. Yeah, 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 no, that's people voluntarily, so. Right, that uh, always blows me away, you know, is that people are sending money over the heads of thousands of people that really, really need it right next door to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I see where you're going there. Exactly, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, the... You know, one of the problems with having uh, an enormous, you know, bureaucratic leviathan is that there's no accountability. There's, you know, there's no efficiency. It's just one enormous, uh, you know, inefficient beast. And mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and so basically, the anarchist or voluntarist um, philosophy is to just break it up into smaller pieces. You know, se secession, basically, right? And uh, and that's how there's strength, strength in smaller communities, right? Would you? What, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree with that, which is that has a lot to do with why we built Peacekeeper. You know, one of Peacekeeper's objectives, there's three. There's protection, independence, and benevolence. And uh, that's why we have small micro groups working. That's, that's why we want to train and equip people to take care of themselves, because we want people to be uh, self-reliant and interdependent on the people they know and trust, not on strangers. Yeah, yeah. So... So, so like with, with you, you have uh, like a few people in your family, like or your close friends that are that are in your network. Yeah, you know, um, when I was so I just moved from San Jose to Rancho Cordova. I live in California, mm -hmm. and so uh, in San Jose, I had a decent amount of people in my network. It's been a challenge in Rancho Cordova over the past week or two weeks, kind of looking for neighbors, you know, because we encourage people not to add strangers to their neighbors, but we encourage them to to get to know their neighbors and scout for the people that they think might be a good fit in their emergency response group. So that's kind of the process I'm in right now is trying to feel people out and mm -hmm. see, okay, you know, would this guy be a good fit? Do I want, you know, do I want this guy showing up if an emergency happens or vice versa? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it is a process, you know, we, we caution people to hook up with strangers because there's a good chance that they won't show up at all and you just don't know. Yeah. You just when it's with strangers, you just don't know, and it's it's better to know. So, so you're saying you're saying uh, first would be close friends or family, and right. then and then would be neighbors. I think that makes the most sense, absolutely, because your close friends and family they trust you, they know you, and they'll get on the system with you pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your neighbors, uh, a lot of people know their neighbors. Some people don't. You know, so. <laughs> It really depends on the person. And if you know your neighbors and you're friends with them, I mean, it's a no-brainer to be on the system. And even for minor things, like if, if your kid falls and breaks his leg and needs a ride to the hospital, you send out that medical alert, your neighbors show up and they help you. You know, you have a, you have a support community there. Mm -hmm. You're not on your own. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, have you heard of uh, Doug Stanhope, the, the comedian? No. <laughs> He's like a libertarian He's one, he was a, one of the most libertarian comedians out there, I think, right now. And he did one thing about immigration. Basically, you know, people say, you know, we should close the borders, you know, keep these people out. They're, they're taking our jobs. They're, you know, destroying <laughs> the infrastructure, you know. And then and he's like, he's like, why do you care about these people? They don't even speak the language. They, sometimes they don't even have shoes. They have, barely have any clothes when they cross the border. Why, do you, why are you yeah. afraid of these people? He's like, well, if they're taking your jobs... <laughs> 
<laughs> and, uh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's your problem. If you can't compete with people that can't even speak the language and can't read, write, and aren't very educated, then <laughs> what kind of job? What does that say about you? <laughs> yeah, basically, what he was saying was like, okay, he doesn't know the language, but you know who knows the language? Your neighbor. How, how good do you know your neighbor? He's like, you live eight years next to your neighbor, and if you happen to check the mail at the same time, you avert eye contact. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. That is so true, you know? And I, I know it's not like that everywhere in the U.S., but I know it is like that in a lot of places, <laughs> too many places. Yeah, like, um, uh, like uh, um, at my parents' house, right? I'm, I'm here with my family, and you know, because we just were temporarily living here. And and so, uh, my fa- my my mother's been my parents been living here since ninety five, right? And we we uh, recently moved in a few months ago. And so um, we have been like walking around the neighborhood, you know, me and my wife and the kids. And we just meet the neighbors and we talk to them and everything. And then I tell I tell my mother, you know, we just met the neighbors. She's like, oh, I never met them. I never talked. To them. You <laughs> met all these neighbors. I- <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and Monica, my, yeah. wife, my wife, she's like, we should take walks more often, I think. <laughs> right. You know, and that kind of goes back to another thing we hope to do with peacekeepers. So we're so used to technology pulling us away from our communities. Yeah. And yes, we spend yes. time on Facebook. I, I'm guilty, too. I do it. We spend time watching TV instead of uh, being out there with our community. So I was really hoping Peacekeeper could be a technology that – pulls people back into their community yeah yeah you know and one thing i uh i realized with me that really um is helping me to connect more with the community now is is uh, because you know we're we're going to homeschool right you know, oh we are too naturally of course you know only, yeah you know, the, the same people homeschool you know <laughs> right right so so that in itself um gets you out into the uh into the community more often. Like I'm taking my kids everywhere, parks, playgrounds, libraries, farmers markets, you know, and right. meeting people all over the place. And, uh, <laughs> well done. Well done. And so, you know, people tell me like, <laughs> well, what about socialization? How are they going to know how to talk to people? <laughs> I was homeschooled and so were my seven brothers and sisters and we don't have any problems. So, <laughs> Oh, were you? Wow. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So was that, was that religious, like, um, type homeschooling or you know my mom my mom wasn't a libertarian or anything like that but she uh she was pretty clever early on and she knew uh, after experiencing the school system a little bit she knew what a joke it was and what a scam it was so she she pulled her kids out of school very nice so yeah so so since uh since the beginning like you didn't attend any any public school at all um right i never got into the first grade nice wow (laughs) So how are you even functioning now? I mean, you don't even have a diploma. <laughs> <laughs> right, no high school diploma. I'm not even, uh, I didn't even, I mean, I'm mostly self-educated. Of for course, the most part. That's, that's, that's what education is. <laughs> right. You know, if you're not interested in what you're doing, that's, that's, that's not, I don't think you can call it education, right? That's forced memorization. That's regurgitation, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot of truth you're speaking, but yeah. <laughs> It's true, you know, it's like, I, I talk to people, uh, a lot of um, mothers that I meet at these various places, and I talk about homeschooling as much as possible, because uh, it just, it can't be overstated enough, you know, so many people uh, just, um, you know, habitually, I guess, just believe that the current state of education is the best thing that we can possibly do for our kids, you know, and... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm always questioning. I'm always explaining different points of, points right. of view. And, you know, one of my big concerns is how the school system pulls children away from their mothers. And, you know, when, when a child should be spending time with their mothers and fathers and their family, yeah. they're spending all this time with, uh, with a lot of times people that they shouldn't be spending time with, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I think Stefan Manu d- was discussing that, uh, how, you know, just putting your kids in daycare and then, and then kindergarten is the, the change that occurs in the brain is equivalent to abandonment or neglect, right? That, right. That, that, that the, the child just, um, you know, it's just physiological changes that occurs and then 
they're forced to cope with the fact that their parents aren't there anymore, you know? Yeah, you know, I don't know all the science behind it, but it makes sense to me. It really does, you know? Um, <clears throat> humans are meant to be with Human children are meant to be with their chil- with their parents. <laughs> so it, that's so revolutionary. What, what kind yeah. of thinking is that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're meant to be hugged every day, kissed every day, nursed. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. taken care of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, my wife does the, uh, the you know the extended breastfeeding. You know, she breastfeeds as often as possible for as long nice. as they, you know, and nice. uh, and they love it. And um, you know, that's not as of course not as socially acceptable either. But, right. Um, you know, she's lucky she has a, a job. She can stay at home and, and do that, um, you know, much longer than she would normally if she had to go back to work, you know. In, right. In a place, right? Right. So, but yeah, yeah, you know, I I have been learning a lot about public education or government schools, better better said. And, yeah. Uh, and I, and it, you just can't talk about it enough because it, it's, it, it's just so ingrained in people that that's the way it is. You don't question it. You know, just send your kids there, you know, where our money is paying for it anyway, might as well use it, <laughs> you know. Right, and I think it's easy, you know, for a lot of parents, it's easier to do that. That's the easier thing to do. Um, it, it gives the mothers a break. They don't have to worry about it. They have free time, um, you know, which is, I think, why a lot of people do it. Yeah, like, yeah, so in that sense, it's more like a, babys- a babysitter, <laughs> right? Right. And, and uh, I mean, I guess it's, it's now people rely on it now more probably since, um, you know, as the currency is getting more and more devalued. So, you know, one person can't necessarily support a household, right? So now you need two people. And so it's getting even more difficult to homeschool if a person wants to, you know. Right, right. So, yeah, you got to make uh, you got to make your own, you know, judgment call as to, uh, you know, if, if you're going to homeschool, you know, you have to be home with your kid. And um, and the other person has to work, but you know you got to live in a place that you know you can afford, you know things like that. So it's right. There are a lot of factors that come into play. A lot of people, you know, they just. I mean, there's probably a lot of people that can't do it. They, if 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 the wife has to go out and work to pay the bills, sometimes that's what you got to do. Yeah. So 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 how does your family um, react to to all of your uh, your beliefs and your you know your volunteerism and anarchist? Oh, I've I've converted most of my family. I've got seven brothers and sisters and my parents, and uh, <clears throat> for the most part, you know, when you when you speak truth to people or and you do it right, um, people recognize truth. You know, they recognize reason, and and a lot of times people just aren't presented with these ideas and these beliefs. Because they're so used to being in public school or, or watching uh, mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Once people get a taste of truth, you know, I think people get a taste of truth and, and, and they start to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Unless they're extremely set in their ways, you know, mm-hmm. if, if, if it's the kind of person that just wants to be right, mm-hmm. you know, instead of, <laughs> you know, find truth, then there's not much you can do. So, so you haven't encountered much resistance at all from your family then? Mm-hmm. No, not wow. really. That's wonderful. Not really. I'm not going to say my family is like full on uh, voluntarists. Yeah. But uh, at this point, most of my family is against the drug war. Most of my family really likes like Ron Paul, you know, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and low taxes, pro freedom, you know. Uh, pretty skeptical of the wars at this yeah. point. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, my family. I grew up um, in a hardcore Democratic family, and. Uh, Last time I voted was two thousand eight. Voted for Obama, <laughs> but not because I not because like I have any passion for Obama, but because you know my family's Democrat. So who are you gonna vote for, Obama? Right. <laughs> you know, Democrat. <laughs> but uh, but then I started reading, educating myself, and uh, and so now I'm a much different mindset. And interestingly enough, now my um, my mother, who is more political minded, she considers herself more of a socialist now, <laughs> <laughs> which is. Uh, even worse, I guess you can say. <laughs> you know? Right, right. I mean, yeah, and so many people, you know, they don't understand the terms, you know, they don't know exactly what it means, they don't know exactly what they're saying. Um, because when people promote these ideas and beliefs, they're really promoting violence. Oh, yeah. A lot of times, if you can show them that, they'll start to, to think about it a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, but people don't want to see the, the smoking gun in the room. Exactly. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the gun in the room. That's what you have to expose. You know, that's um, right. I don't know if you've seen. Uh, I, I posted a video um, of Mark Stevens. Have you heard of this guy, Mark Stevens? Yes, I have heard of Mark Stevens. He does a lot of work in uh, courts, um, but you know, battling head on with the with the judges and lawyers, and um, basically, um, he uses logical fallacies to to you know <laughs> just pull the rug out from under there you know, sophist arguments, and uh, he has a lot of success with just throwing out a lot of victimless crime charges. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really amazing. You know, the guy wrote two books, and so I interviewed him. I was very lucky to have been able to... Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, very lucky to be able to interview him. Fascinating guy. A lot of stories, a lot of great stories to share. And uh, and so, yeah, so so that's another way, is using using the logical fallacies, you know, um, in in just showing the inconsistencies in the statist argument, you know, you have to universalize a principle for it to be valid, right? So, <laughs> if I can't steal from my neighbor to fund my child's education, how is it okay if I can vote for a politician to do that <laughs> through property taxes, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, and I think what you'll find with most statists is they haven't really thought about the fundamentals. Um, they focus on issues and people that they disagree with. They don't focus on philosophy or, or the, the foundation of their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and most statists, my biggest problem is that most statists don't have any red lines. They don't have points where they say, okay, this is as far as I would go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's scary because, you know, if you're not willing to say, hey, I, I'm... I'm willing to, to stop at this point. You're no different than the Nazi society, you know, or a, or a communist Russian society. There's oh, yeah. no difference. And I don't think humans are all that different. We're all humans, you oh, know, yeah. humans. Oh, yeah. So yeah, like that, that map right behind you, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, um, how do you say, um, inaccurate. <laughs> in, that, in, that, in, in that there's different names for all those ge geographical regions, right? If you just right. call it, just call it. People live there. People live there. People live there, <laughs> right? But when you say, you know, Africans live here, French people live here, Russian people live here, then right. then we then you can then you can group people in the, in together. Yeah, and no, put labels on them. Yeah, put labels. People think you know they're really different. They're it, they're Muslims. Those people are dangerous. You know, right? <laughs> Rather than thinking they're just people and. We have more in common with the Muslims in Iraq or Iran than we do with our own political masters. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> you know, so so we have to break down this double standard hypocrisy that we uh, have erected for government. That you know, the law of morality applies to all of us, except if you call yourself government. <laughs> yeah, no, you have to apply the laws equally. You know, and I always say that you know. When I'm arguing with people about what police should and shouldn't be able to do, um, I just ask people, hey, if you did that thing, would your actions be justified? And if they say no, well, then nor is it justified if a police officer does it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if, if you're stopping someone from hurting someone else, not only can a police officer do that, so can you. Yeah. But uh, if you're going to break, kick some guy's door down and haul him off to jail because he was smoking a plant. Yeah. Uh, it, if it's not right for you, it's not right for the cops. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, I, uh, it reminds me of that recent video that I saw. I don't know if you you saw it. The, this guy was um, like his his there was, there was a police officer there with a gun drawn, right? And and his, his this guy's friend who was filming, he's already down on the floor with his hands behind his head, you know, scared. And then the guy filming, he's standing. He's like, I don't want to. I'm not going to get on the floor. I'm scared. But I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to get on the floor. And the police officer was like, go on the floor. I'm like, I didn't do anything. Why are you doing it? And, he's like, and the police officer was like, I, I got to figure this out. Get on the floor. <laughs> so basically, you know, he didn't understand anything what was going on. But he has to, uh, they have to assert their domination, right? Right. They have to control the situation. Uh, That's people. interesting to hear from a police officer say, I have to figure this out. Because <laughs> yeah. it sounds like he's really thinking about it, which... <laughs> A, a lot of times you won't get that kind of openness. You'll get people just saying, pulling out their taser and just yeah. Yeah. going to, to the hardcore. 
Yeah, and then eventually another another cop car came, another police officer came, drew his, drew his gun. So this guy had two guns on him. And, oh, wow. And finally the guy, he starts crying. He's You know, his camera's still rolling. He's, he's crying. He's like, he's like, you guys are cowards. You're just men. You Without those badges, without those guns, you're just men pointing guns at me. You're cowards. Be a man. <laughs> you know, put down the guns. That's interesting. I haven't seen that video. Yeah, I can uh, uh, see. If, I don't know if I can find it, but it was a really good one in that the guy was just, it was amazing how much truth he was speaking in that he was so... Um, you know, you know, ner- you know, nervous and stressed and all. Oh right. my God. <laughs> you know, crazy. and I, I try, you know, with all the indifferences I have a lot with police, I try and look at police as just our brothers and sisters that are misguided. And I know that at one point, you know, at one point I was a pretty uh, ridiculous conservative and I supported the police state. So I believe those things. I almost signed up for the military. Wow. So <laughs> because I know that I was there once, I try and empathize with them, you know, and I try and uh, I try and just keep the door open to trying to to make connections and trying to convert people and trying to change people's minds. Yeah, yeah, police. It's uh, it's, it's it's difficult, you know. They're, 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 in, they're in such they're in such a position of power, you know. It's basically they have a license to kill, you know, and they have no accountability, no responsibility, you know. They, you know they they do whatever to people, you know. You know, theft, assault, rape, murder, and what do they get? Administrative leave, paid vacations. <laughs> you know, what's what's the accountability, right? So, how do you deal with that? <laughs> right. You know, how do you talk to somebody like that who can just assert their domination over you, you know, right. at a whim? Right? Yeah, I don't know if you know about uh, like Ian Freeman and the Free State Project yeah, and about what that, they're yeah. doing. I think he's very good at talking to. Uh, politicians and judges and other police officers he's a really good example on how to reach out to people with kind of a a peaceful attitude reach out in love and get people to really think about what they're doing um it's a good model i think oh yeah oh yeah definitely um yeah like uh right here where where i now live we we live i think two houses down from a police officer (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's a little bit nervous, you know, when I drive past his house, and uh, it's like it's like yeah, it's a little bit nerve wracking, you know. And and I wonder right. if I were to go to his house, I wonder, and I were to take this app, you know, and explain it to him, would he be open to it, or would he feel threatened by it, or you know, I'm, right? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's hard. It's hard, especially if you've had a bad experience with police. It's very hard, but. You know, it, it's really a decision. If you make up your mind to reach out to those people and 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 care about those people, you're going to have a better chance of, of changing the world for a positive and changing those people's minds. Have, so, you, have you had good conversations with police officers? I definitely have, yes. Wow. I've had, you know, there were times where I considered being a jerk to a police officer, but I was actually nice and had a very... I felt like it was a very influential conversation. Uh, there have been times where I was just kind of gave the police the same attitude they gave me and it didn't go anywhere so so were those conversations online or in person in person okay was that like after, when they stopped you like for <laughs> for speeding yeah. or something <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? and, yeah and what did you say you know i just i talked about philosophy hey man why are you writing me a ticket like i have a family at home i can't pay this i can't afford it you know and uh-huh. and try to get the person to think about uh how his actions were actually affecting people. So I've, you know, it didn't save me from getting the ticket. A couple times I have, I have had police officers not write me tickets. But um, you know, I feel like if enough people said that when they got pulled over, hey, you're hurting me. You're hurting my family. I have children. You're hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, it might start to change a lot of people's minds. You should that are doing the oppressing. You should definitely check out my interview with Mark Stevens. This okay. <laughs> because that's exactly what he what he um, defends. People like that, you know, speeding, speeding, you know, moving violations, parking violations, right? Um, drug possession, you know, things like that. And and basically, his the first way that he presents his argument is um, <clears throat> um, prove to me, show me the evidence that the laws and the Constitution apply to my client just because he's physically in the state of California, Arizona, Texas, whichever state, right? Prove to me, right? What's the evidence? (laughs) And they cannot answer that question. There is no evidence, right, that laws apply to people. Everything they say 
is a logical fallacy. It's fascinating, you know, and appeal to appeal to antiquity, appeal to force, um, <laughs> you know, appeal to popular opinion, <laughs> appeal to right. authority. You know, uh, right. it's, it's just so and many logical facts. And he just goes down the list. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, most people hearing what you just said will not be able to grasp that because their mind is so entrenched in like the current system. They, will, they don't even grasp that. What do you mean laws don't apply to me? Of course they do. You know, people, yeah. and you know, ultimately people don't understand the fundamentals of what a law is yeah. and what a right is. And what, what are, you know, what is this and that? So, so, so essentially what, what, um, what a lot of people recommend doing is, you know, just getting the ticket, you know, don't fight the guy. Just if he's going to write you a ticket, you know, let him write you a ticket. And then when you go to court, that's your opportunity to present all of these arguments, um, you know, to the judge and to the lawyer. And, um, and that's what I'm, I'm really interested in learning more about doing because, you know, so many people, when you get a ticket, you're like, you know, this is so annoying. I got to pay a ticket. God damn, I don't want to, I don't want to fight it. I just want to get this over with, right? <laughs> nobody, okay. nobody really contests it, right? Because it says, you, you just think like, you know, it's just a matter of course. You just pay the ticket. What else, what else are you going to do? <laughs> right. 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 And it's hard, like in California, um, they make you forfeit bail before. So if you, if you go to court, they're going to charge you an extra two to 300 bucks right up front. So they'll say, you need to pay this amount. Uh, before we even let you have your day in court. It's a really? pretty corrupt system. Yeah. Wow. And then if you lose in court, which you're going to a lot of times, uh, they're going to charge you extra oh for God. court fees. Yeah. So, so, and then you missed out on a day of work, a bunch of stress, you know. Exactly. So, exactly. so, so basically, if you, if you, if you claim, uh, if you uh, put not guilty, right, then, then that, all, that happens, right? Then you have to pay them. Yeah, before yeah. you can get your trial. Before you can get your trial. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean um, yeah, the, you know, some of the stories that he's told me, you know, he's like, you know, just, you know, because some, some of the lawyers, there's this one lawyer who said, you know, the proof that laws apply is all the people that are currently in jail. <laughs> and he's like, are you serious? <laughs> that's, that's not an argument. That's just saying, right. that's just, that's the appeal to force. That's saying, because I can hurt you, that means laws apply. <laughs> because, you know? Right. That is, <laughs> it's like, that's might makes right, right there. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Because, that's about right. <laughs> because, I can bomb, because I can bomb your country, um, what we're doing is correct. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. So that's, that's the way, that's the way the fun they function, right? So, he what, like what you just said. He exposes the gun in the room, right? And and another way, another another interesting thing he did what one time was um, he had a uh, a witness on the stand, right? And he said to the witness, um, "Did you come here out of your own free will?" Right? The witness says, "Of course I did." <laughs> He's like, I'm, "I'm sorry. Is this your name on the subpoena right here?" <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's my name. Wait, 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 wait. I'm confused. You just told me you came here of your own free will, yet you were subpoenaed here, right, by law <laughs> to attend. <laughs> and so that's, again, pointing out the force, the gun, right, yes. the violence of, of government. There is no choice, right? And, um, <laughs> and, then, and then he basically says, you know, you, how can you trust this witness? This witness just perjured himself. He just lied. <laughs> He, you know, he just contradicted himself. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. It? It's amazing. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> oh, definitely check this man out. This guy is, is really awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview him again probably because he's got, his stories are just so awesome. They have to be told and retold and retold. Um, yeah, he's just a great learner. Like, I don't know any other, any other um, anarchist who's doing this kind of work. Like, he focuses in the courts. That's his field, you know. And he, oh, and by the way, he's not a lawyer at all. <laughs> he's, got oh, wow. no, he's got no credentials as a lawyer <laughs> wow isn't that amazing but he's, yeah. been doing, he's been doing this for like 10 years and you know incredible success of course depending on he's like depending on how, how far along um, you know the case is you know if they call him too late then it's kind of difficult but um, you know he's told me that he's, he's got into conversations with this one guy who's a supreme court lawyer right he's like this guy had an ego supreme court lawyer like 
Like, this guy is good at what he does, but again, same logical fallacies, you know, um, you just have to know how to identify them. Mm. So, so yeah. <laughs> so, if you ever, you know, if you ever get a ticket again, um, please call this guy and um, he'll give you some excellent advice or, you know, I suggest you read his books or just watch that YouTube channel and just check out his videos. He's got... You know, success story after success story after success story. <laughs> I'll definitely take a look. And, and then he's got this other thing, call it, the call of shame, which is basically when when he um, when, when people he call he talks to lawyers or IRS agents over the phone, and and he uh, he basically you know trips them up of you know of their own contradictions. <laughs> it's just wonderful. So, so you know who else is really good at that is uh, Larkin Rose. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. He, uh, yeah, I, he's I, good at taking a simple concept and idea and presenting it in a way that most people can understand. And yeah, have you have you read his book, The Most Dangerous Superstition? No, I've just seen his Facebook stuff. Oh yeah, no, no, he does a lot of great stuff there. Um, but I read the book. I read the book, and it's just it it put a lot of things into perspective, helped me understand things much better, and you know, so I can explain it to people. Right. And because, like you said, you know. We have to be able to explain these concepts simple and straightforward for you know laymen to understand, um, because that's how that's how we reach people. You know, it's you know one mind at a time, right? <laughs> so and not and by the way, do it without offending them or putting them on the defensive. You know, because so many people, when you mention the word government, there's so much emotion that's wrapped up in that in that <clears throat> word, right? right? Right. So, 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 what's your like um, when you talk to people? Like, what's your strategy for, you know, explaining these concepts? How do you go about doing it? Uh, stay calm. Ask questions. Uh, concede some points every once in a while. Yeah. You know, find common ground. That's true. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good thing. Um. Yeah. Uh, really uh, focus on the the root of the problem. You know, not not issues here and there that aren't fundamental. Yeah. Immigration. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, yeah. With me, like one thing I notice is, um, especially my family, <laughs> because it's so democratic and socialistic. I guess. Um, they right. tend to be very emotional. They get very emotional. Right. It's angry. hard with family. Oh with my God, family, right. it's way harder because. Oh yeah, it's very hard. Family get like you're saying. They get emotional. Woo! And but but you know one thing is actually interesting is uh, that is a logical fallacy in itself. You know, appeal to emotion. So <laughs> so when somebody gets physically or viscerally angry at what you're saying, that's basically an admittance of a failed argument. You know, or a lack of argument. Right. You know, they have no recourse right to fall back on other than anger and insults and you know <laughs> offensive remarks right to me when people get angry it, it tells me a couple things it tells because i was there i used to be that person and uh it tells me that uh one they're not extremely confident in their views they're not really uh rooted in anything they don't have a foundation and uh, it also tells me that they're a lot of times people take a critique of a, a belief or an idea or a system as a critique against themselves. They, they take it as a personal attack. Oh, yeah. Um, because a lot of times people uh, don't aren't able to dis distinguish themselves between their own government or their own collective groups that they're involved in. So, like, you know, for me, like, anytime you attacked America, I felt as if I was being attacked attacked as a person because yeah. it's like oh that's my country yeah, yeah, yeah. when really what is a country a country isn't even a real thing yeah. you know it's a made-up idea it doesn't exist it doesn't have life yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like uh it's like you know when i would tell uh, my family that i'm going to homeschool especially my parents you know and you know they would get angry and and i think part of that is because i was you know i went to public school and so you know their one argument is you went to public school and you turned out okay so <laughs> right you know and and it's like a, it's like an, a it's a it's a affront to their style of parenting right? exactly that's how they exactly it, you know 
but you know we shouldn't you shouldn't take it like that you know it's like you know when you parent especially you know you parent with the knowledge that you have at hand right to and your i guess you know mental capacity so as you grow and learn new things you're going to change right we all change right so you know you really you really want your kids to do to be like carbon copies of you <laughs> like what kind of a world would that be <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a great point. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people that aren't, you know, that I don't know, there's a lot of people that are like, hey, I did it this way, you should do it this way, too. You know, it's, it's, it's not the idea of making our, our offspring or our children better than we were, but uh, making them like us or similar to us. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, and how does that and how does the society progress if, if the next generation is always stagnating? in in the you know <laughs> in the closed minded culture of the previous generation right <laughs> right right <laughs> so so yeah that's uh, that's definitely some of the difficulties i uh, i encounter with this but um all right so i guess we'll uh wrap this up uh we both have kids so we got some necessity uh jobs to do <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity cody um, so let people know, um, you know, if you have any closing remarks, um, and let people know where they can find your work. Yeah, you know, you guys, uh, you can check out peacekeeper.org. Um, you can just search in the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store for Peacekeeper. You'll see it pop up. It's got the blue and red shield, and you can watch one of our videos there. I just encourage people to check out the app. Consider becoming a force for good in your neighborhood. Consider taking on some level of responsibility for the people you know and love and trust. And uh, it can make the world a lot better place and maybe even save your life one day. So it's worth checking out. Beautiful. And just, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, just encourages establishing ties and bonds to the people who live near you, right? Rather than uh, people who live in some of your country, geographical regions that you've never been to and that you never met. <laughs> You never met the people there. So get to know your neighbor. That's the message, right? Would you say? Absolutely. <laughs> get, to, get to know the people around you. Beautiful. All right. Thank you very much, Cody. Uh, so this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much.